In this lecture, we'll continue talking about applications of linear algebra, this time to chemistry. Specifically, we'll be talking about balancing chemical equations. In chemistry, when we have a reaction, chemicals are combined to produce other chemicals, and we represent this with a reaction. So in this example, we've got propane, which is C3H8, and that means three atoms of carbon combined with eight atoms of hydrogen to create that compound, plus oxygen, O2, which is two atoms of oxygen. And when they're combined and burned, this produces water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2. So the chemical notation here is that the subscript represents the number of atoms of that element in that chemical. But what we would say when we look at this equation is that this equation is unbalanced, because on the left-hand side of the equation, we have three atoms of carbon, but on the right-hand side of the equation, we only have one atom of carbon. So the general principle that we need to apply here is that the atoms are neither created nor destroyed by that reaction. They're just rearranged. So if there were 10 million carbon atoms before the reaction, and all of that propane we were burning, there will still be 10 million carbon atoms after the reaction. So the idea here is that we want to try to find the ratios of if we had, for example, if we knew how much propane we had, how much carbon dioxide will be produced. We know that there will be the same number of carbon atoms, and so we should be able to figure that out. So the way that we represent these ratios is by finding coefficients. So what we're looking for are numbers that we can put in front of each of the, the compounds, each of the, the chemicals, so that the number of atoms of each element on the left-hand side equals the number of atoms of each element on the right-hand side. And specifically, we're looking for whole numbers, positive integers, to place in each of those four spots. So saying that the number of carbon atoms on the left-hand side should equal the number of carbon atoms on the right-hand side, well, the number of carbon atoms on the left-hand side is whatever number we find for x1 multiplied by 3. So 3x1, and that's going to equal the number of carbon atoms on the right-hand side, which is whatever number x4 we find multiplied by 1, because there's just the one carbon atom there. So 3x1 would have to equal x4. We do the same thing for hydrogen. x1, there's 8 atoms of hydrogen in C3H8, so on the left-hand side we have 8x1 atoms of hydrogen. And on the right-hand side, we have 2 times x3 atoms of hydrogen. On the left-hand side, we have 2x2 atoms of oxygen. And oxygen appears twice on the right-hand side. We've got x3, H2O, and then 2x4 from the CO2. And that gives us a system of three equations with four variables. Now we can write those equations in our standard form, and what we see is that we have a homogeneous system of linear equations, which we know will always have a solution. And in our typical way, we'll write that system of homogeneous equations in augmented matrix form, and, and then we'll reproduce that augmented matrix. That reproduced matrix looked like this, and then again, as usual, our last step will be to rewrite that in equation form. So our solution here is that x1 equals 1 3rd x4, x2 equals 5 thirds x4, x3 equals 4 thirds x4, that should say x4 there, and x4 is, th is free. So because we have a free variable, that means we have infinitely many possible solutions to place in those spots. But there's really two restrictions that we want to apply. We want to make sure that each of these coefficients is a whole number, and we want to make sure that those whole numbers are as small as possible. So since we get to choose the value for x4, we're going to choose a value that makes these, first of all, all whole numbers, which since we have threes in our denominator, means that x4 should be a multiple of three. And we want to make it be the smallest multiple of three we can, and so we should choose that x4 equals three. That's going to make x3 equal four, that's going to make x2 equal five, and that's going to make x1 equal one. And that will be the solution that we'll have for our system of equations. The final balanced equation looks like this. Notice that we typically don't write the 1 in front of C3H8, so we'll just leave that as a blank space. And if we want to check the number of carbon atoms on the left versus the number of carbon atoms on the right, we've got three carbon atoms here, and we've got three carbon atoms here, so that checks out. If we want to check the hydrogen atoms, we've got eight hydrogen atoms here. Four times two is eight hydrogen atoms there. And if we want to check the oxygen, we have 10 oxygen atoms on the left, and we have four 
plus 3 times 2 is 6, so 4 plus 6 is 10, oxygen atoms on the right. So everything balances just like we want. So some things to keep in mind when you're using linear algebra to balance a chemical equation. You're going to have one equation for each element that appears in the equation. So if you have five different elements, you're going to have five equations, with each equation representing the number of atoms of that element on the left equaling the number of atoms of that element on the right. Then you'll have one variable for each chemical that appears in the equation. In other words, one variable for each coefficient that you're looking for. This will always give you a homogeneous system, so there will usually be many solutions. And what we're looking for is the solution that where all of the variables are positive integers and where those integers are as small as possible.